good morning. Um, I'd rather be there with you in India, but given the pandemic, this is what it is. Uh, the I just want to do a technical check, though. Do you see my slide on the screen, or do you also see my next slide? Yes, sir. You can see the slide. One slide. Okay, good. I want to um, well, the global pandemic has been devastating. The human costs are unfathomable. And uh, it's also sped up many of the trends of the digital age by years or even decades as we now uh, shop, consume, work, entertain ourselves, uh, collaborate, learn online in ways that we've never done before. The pandemic has also challenged many leaders and institutions, and uh, those that have failed will be replaced. Donald Trump was one of the first. But also, um, it's challenged many of our systems as well, our supply chains. How can we not get a, a mask to someone? Uh, to a, fr a frontline PPE worker or worker. Uh, why is there hoarding? People hoard because of fear and lack of transparency into the supply chain. You know, if, if you know that the supply chain will be delivering paper towels tomorrow, you're not going to go buy three years of them. Um, it's challenged our systems for data as health data has been buried in silos and we've been unable to build an effective response to the pandemic. And when the dust settles, as it surely will, hopefully a lot of it this year, our institutions and our systems will be very different. Now, the pandemic is also intersecting with the digital age in a number of other ways in that there's a new era that's emerging that is creating a demand pull and a technology push for us to accelerate the adoption of new technologies. For the last 40 years, and I've been through all of it, <laughs> we had the mainframe, mini computer, PC, the internet, the cloud, big data, the web, social media. And now technology is extending out into the physical world, billions and trillions of inert objects that become smart. We have technologies that learn to do things that they weren't previously programmed to do. Um, and the foundational technology for all of this, to me, is the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies or blockchain. Blockchain. Now, it's not the most sonorous word in the world, but to me, this represents the second era of the internet. Let me explain. The internet, fad for 40 years, is about information. But if I send you some information, a PDF of this deck, a PowerPoint, you know, a, a photograph, an email, a Word document, I'm actually not sending you the information. I'm sending you a copy. And that works great for information. We've all had a printing press at our fingertips. But when it comes to assets, things that really matter to the Indian economy, things of value like money, securities, intellectual property, the data in our identities, art, music, votes. A vote is an asset, something of value that belongs to somebody. Sending copies of those is a bad idea. You don't want someone copying your identity or your vote. And if I send you $1,000, it's really important that I don't still have the money, right? So the way that we manage this problem in our economy is through intermediaries, banks, um, stock exchanges, credit card companies, tr uh, escrow agents, transfer agents, um, governments to a certain extent, um, social media companies, and they perform all of the business and transaction logic for virtually every type of commerce. 
They identify the party you are, who you are, or the asset. That's a dollar. They clear and settle transactions. They keep records. And overall, they've done a pretty good job, but there are limitations. First, they use centralized services that can be hacked. They exclude 2 billion people who don't have enough money to justify a bank account. They take a piece of the value for performing this service, say 10% for sending money internationally. And why does it take 47 days for, for an Indian doctor in Toronto to send money to his mother in, in um, Delhi? They capture our data, preventing us from using it for our own benefit and undermining, uh, benefit and undermining our privacy. And they're capturing the benefits of the digital age asymmetrically. Um, today, there's wealth creation, but there's growing social inequality. So what if, what if there were not just an internet of information? What if there were an internet of value, some kind of vast global distributed ledger where anything of value from money to securities to a vote could be managed, stored, transacted, exchanged securely and privately? without a middleman. Well, in 2008, that's exactly what happened. Satoshi Nakamoto, an anonymous person or persons, uh, outlined a new protocol for a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system using a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. And this was an extraordinary thing because for the first time in human history, people could trust each other to do transactions anonymously, but also without a middleman. And trust was not achieved by an intermediary. It was achieved by cryptography, collaboration, and some, some very clever code. So this is a more secure platform for not just money, but ultimately for the management of any asset. Now, in North America, there's a television show called um, by a guy named John Oliver. It's a comedy show. He did a whole uh, show on blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And um, I had a great analogy, I thought, on why a platform like this was so secure. But he had some fun with it. So you can see I don't really use that analogy anymore. I'll give you... It is very secure. Now relax. I'm not going to get into what that process is or how it works, but I will share a really helpful, really dumb metaphor for why it is safe. The way I like to think of it is that a, a blockchain is a highly processed thing, sort of like a chicken McNugget. And if you wanted to hack it, it'd be like turning a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now, someday someone will be able to do that, but for now, it's going to be tough. Hold on. That is an absolutely horrible thought. So why is that reporter so happy about the idea? Because if anyone ever figures out how to turn a chicken McNuggets back into a chicken, that chicken is going to be <laughs> up. He's going to spend the rest of his life suffering from PTSD and writing haunting poetry about the experience. The things I saw, buck, buck, buckor. My body is whole, but what of my soul? My body is whole, but what of my soul? So you can see why I don't use it anymore. <laughs> now, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency, but it was also the first application of blockchain. Kind of like email was the first application of the Internet of Information. But now there are all kinds of other platforms like Hyperledger, Ethereum, and so on, that enable the creation of any asset. And there's a new class of entrepreneurs and a new class of assets um, that are arising. Extraordinary uh, companies like Cosmos or Polkadot that attempt to, Cosmos describes itself as the internet of value. And this Thursday, it's launching Stargate, it's a big new platform to link blockchains together. Ethereum, I mentioned, Cardano, the so-called Ethereum killer. Um, these are some of the more exciting uh, new platforms. 
So I'm not here today to tell you about investing in, um, in new assets, new platforms, though. I'm here today just to comment about what does all this mean? Well, if we do have a bifurcation of wealth, how are we going to solve that problem? Well, normally that's done through the pre, or sorry, the redistribution of wealth. But once again, the technology genie has escaped from the bottle. And it was summoned by this anonymous person or persons at this uncertain time in history. And it's not going to solve a bunch of problems for it, but it does give us another kick at the can to rewrite the economic power grid and the old order of things. And there are all kinds of ways that we can use this new generation of technology to pre-distribute wealth, to bring people closer to the economy, and in a sense, to create a new halcyon age of entrepreneurship and justice. So we can bring billions into the global economy. Even something like Facebook's DM, formerly called Libra, if they were to implement that, there'd be hundreds of millions of people who now had access to banking services who didn't before. And Zuckerberg's uh, claim was that sending money should be as easy as sending a message. That's possible now. We can protect rights through immutable records. 80% of land titles in India are not enforceable. Uh, you know, you have a piece of land, your parents pass away, you go to the land titles office to get it transferred to you, and um, someone's bribed a local clerk. And all of a sudden, you don't own your land, you're paying rent. So if you put land titles on a blockchain, then no one can mess with them, and, and they can be publicly available for the journalists and lawyers and governments and the international community and so on to see that land titles could be protected. Now, of course, it's a big challenge to get a valid land title in the first place, but that's another issue. We could create a true sharing economy. Look at something like Airbnb. Everything Airbnb does could be done by some smart contracts and distributed applications on a blockchain. And I describe how this would work in Blockchain Revolution and also in my TED Talk, which many of you have seen. We could end the remittance ripoff. People who've left their ancestral lands, like India, they go to, say, Canada. They send money back home. It takes four to seven days. They're charged 10 to 20%. This is a ripoff. It's almost a trillion dollars. And... With a blockchain platform, we can eliminate that very quickly, and there are big projects underway. We can ensure that the creators of value are fairly compensated for that value. Songwriters today, a hit song, you get one-tenth of the revenue that you got 35 years ago. Well, Imogen Heap showed the way forward. You put your song on a blockchain platform, the song is inside a smart contract that governs the use of the song. And you want someone to listen to it, maybe it's free. You want to put it in your movie and the song says, what do you want to do? Is it a theme song, background music? Somebody's going to sing it, it's a ringtone. The, the, the way she describes it is my song acts as a business protecting my rights. It's ensuring that the creator of value is fairly compensated. We can create a new world for entrepreneurs because of blockchain dropping transaction costs in the economy. That means that firms can become more open and more networked. The reason that we have vertically integrated corporations is largely because of the transaction costs of of doing things outside the firm are lower than inside the firm. Well, now the cost of, of contracting can be uh, reduced dramatically by smart contracts. The cost of establishing trust outside a firm can be dropped dramatically. So that this creates big opportunities. And then we can also use blockchain to transform our institutions of government for the better better, cheaper government, we can have 
central bank digital currencies, the rupee should become a digital currency as soon as possible. China is moving very quickly on this. If they do, they're going to establish the Chinese RMB as the, um, the currency of record, replacing the U.S. dollar. India needs to move quickly. And I would like to meet with Prime Minister Modi to uh, discuss that. And then um, finally, we can strengthen our democratic institutions because there is a crisis of legitimacy that exists. The Internet of Information has created a fragmentation of public discourse, and we can all follow our own point of view. People can present false information and get a big following for it. The person who did that very effectively was Donald Trump, and it got him into power. And he almost kept in power uh, with a campaign of false information. Most recently, based on this false information, that um, he attempted to overthrow the results of a legitimate democratic election, something that is unimaginable in the United States. And uh, he was just impeached again for it. Now, he wasn't finally convicted, but anyone who's a thoughtful person knows that he's the one who incited this mob to attack the Capitol. So legitimacy is the idea that you may not like who's in power, but at least you think the system is the best system. There are a lot of people challenging that now. So how could we fix that? Well, we created this first wave of democracy. You think about it in India, it's a lot better than what existed before in the British rule and so on. But we established these elected institutions, but there was opacity, um, a weak mandate, citizens were inert, and um, representatives were, were not accountable to citizens, they were accountable to powerful interests. Now, technology doesn't solve these problems, but it enables us as humans to solve these problems. And we can create a second wave that has transparency, a culture of public deliberation rather than citizens being passive recipients. You vote, I rule. We can have active citizenship, representatives accountable to citizens. Why can't we vote where the vote is inside a smart contract, specifying not just who we're voting for, but specifying the leader? So this is a second era of democracy. And these are seven of hundreds of opportunities that we're studying at the Blockchain Research Institute. Now, prosperity is just one of the many opportunities. So this is creating a leadership crisis around the world. We have this pandemic and the global recession that's causing a demand pull for change. We have a new technology creating a technology push and um, we just, uh, at the Blockchain Research Institute, wrote a big report for Al Gore, sorry, for Al Gore, based on the, uh, on the report that I'd written for Al Gore many years ago, uh, to Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris. And if you Google Don Tapscott, um, Joe Biden report, uh, you can get a copy of that report. It's a big document, 120 pages, and it shows what a government could be doing to respond to this next era of the digital age. New paradigms cause dislocation and confusion. They're nearly always received with coolness or worse. And vested interests fight against change. And leaders of old of the old paradigm often have difficulty embracing the new. So if you will it, you can be a leader for change. Here are some new things. You know about blockchain revolution, of course. It's the big book on this topic. But we have two new books out now that are available on Amazon.com. Uh, the Financial Services Revolution by Alex Tapscott. It's a gorgeous uh, book. He's written a big essay in the book, and it's got a, uh, some just wonderful chapters in there by other authors. And The Supply Chain Revolution is the first book to talk about new technology fixing our supply chain problems in the pandemic. So I hope that you'll both enjoy these books. And I'd also like to invite you to attend our courses. There are four online courses on blockchain revolution for the enterprise, and they're provided through Coursera. 
and also INSEAD, which is one of the most important business schools in the world. And we have four new courses on blockchain and financial services as well. We spent almost a million dollars developing these courses, so I hope that you'll find them uh, helpful. And if you roll uh, today um, at Coursera.org, blockchain-revolution, you get a seven-day free trial. So I hope that you'll enjoy that. So uh, my time is up, but I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, please do feel free to follow up in any of these ways. And um, this is a time of great difficulty and, and, and danger, but it's also a time of wonderful opportunity. And um, we can build a better world, and technology can help us do that, uh, but only if we will it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Don. Uh, for the fabulous presentation. It was indeed an insightful presentation. Uh, shall we move on and take one question, please? Good morning, Mr. Don, and uh, thank you for this excellent uh, uh, presentation. It's very insightful. Uh, one uh, question is that, uh, you know, uh, like you rightly point out, blockchain basically uh, removes this challenges which currently being posed by all intermediaries. But there is also a political issue here because uh, the intermediaries in many of many countries actually hold a substantial amount of wealth because of the asymmetry. How do you think that uh, uh, this can actually be addressed from a, in a social system? Well, as I said, leaders of old paradigms have difficulty embracing the new invested interests fight against change. So some old governments, institutions, regulators, and regulatory regimes, along with industries that are challenged or threatened like this, like the financial services industry, in many countries have reacted badly. Now in some countries, um, at least some of them are being very smart about this. And you've got, you know, JP Morgan and Fidelity that are reinventing big parts of the financial industry to embrace this technology. Um, the, uh, the new proposed chairman of the SEC in the United States is someone who's been teaching a course on blockchain at MIT <laughs> and um, knows all about this stuff deeply. I know because he used my book and my TED talk in his course. <laughs> So there are signs of hope. And, um, you know, I had a meeting with Mukesh Ambani um, when I was in uh, India, and he told me that he wants to reinvent many of his institutions and his companies, starting with Geo, around a blockchain platform. And um, Reliance Industries became a member of the Blockchain Research Institute as well. So it's uneven. Um, but it's inexorable, and this is going to happen. And uh, people who can't embrace a new paradigm, we know what happens to them. The, the, um, they end up on the wayside and uh, being bypassed and being replaced. So, so the stakes are very, very high. Mm -hmm.